All right, everyone. Welcome back to the land of hell. I am your host and the author. My name is Jeffrey Drum. Thank you all so much for joining me again. All right, everyone. Welcome back. This is episode 31 biopolymer and chemical sealants. So now that I've presented the overall theory for the function of the Egyptian pyramids that's contained within my book, The Land of Chem, I'm now going to start to present some smaller details regarding these structures that will hopefully facilitate a deeper understanding of exactly what these structures are and how they really operated. So in today's episode, I'm going to present some research that was developed by the Geopolymer Institute in France. And this research organization has collected numerous samples of stone from the Egyptian pyramids and conducted a laboratory analysis of this material. And this laboratory analysis included chemical composition assessment, microscope analysis, experimentation to replicate these artificial stones, etc. And I will say at this point that the theory of geopolymer is highly compatible with my work on the ancient civilization that was well versed in the practice of chemistry. However, I am also very well aware of the capabilities of ancient stone masons to cut, move, and build with real stone. So in today's episode, I'm simply going to present the research and you can come to your own conclusions. To all of the new viewers here on the land of chem, like, comment, subscribe, and help me get this material out there. I think that is it for the intro. So without further ado, let's get right to it. All right, everyone, here we go with tonight's video. So in my previous series of episodes regarding the function of the Great Pyramid and Central Pyramids of Giza, I have gone into extensive detail explaining exactly how both of these structures were utilized to produce two different acidic solutions. So the Great Pyramid of Giza, which you see here in this diagram, was utilized to produce a dilute solution of sulfuric acid. And the central pyramid of Giza, which you see the internal components here in this diagram, was utilized to produce a dilute solution of hydrochloric acid. Now, all of the reactions that were occurring inside of both of these pyramids would not have been possible without the use of chemically resistant coating compounds that were applied to the interior walls of these stone chambers. And these chemically resistant sealing compounds would have prevented the corrosive vitriolic effects of these acidic solutions from deteriorating the stone walls of these chambers. And in my previous episode, my 2021 research expedition recap covering the central pyramid of Giza, I presented some evidence which details the conservation efforts that were conducted inside of the central pyramid, which included a mechanical removal of the salt buildup from the interior walls of the chamber and a removal of some old quote unquote finishing mortar that was done from the walls. Now, I would argue that that finishing mortar quote unquote was in fact a chemically resistant sealing compound that was applied to the inner walls of these chambers to again prevent the corrosive effects of the acidic solutions that were being produced inside of those chambers. So in my assessment of the research that was conducted by the Geopolymer Institute in France, I discovered this. And here on this slide, this is the first piece of research that I have extracted from that Geopolymer Institute in France. And they conducted not only microscope analysis, but also x-ray analysis of the samples of stone that were taken from the Egyptian pyramids. And you can very clearly see on this sample that there is a thick coating layer that has been applied to the outside of this stone. And this gentleman describes it as a synthetic coating that has been applied to the outside of the stone. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is conclusive proof that the civilization that built these monuments was capable of producing synthetic, chemically resistant sealing compounds that could have been applied to the interior walls of the chambers of the Egyptian pyramids to prevent the corrosive effects of the acidic solutions that were being produced inside of those structures. At the beginning, I had to study some stones, some genuine stones, and I discovered on this lower sample here the presence of strange artifacts that I called filaments. And then we have a lot of air bubble. This is a stone that is covered with a synthetic coating. 
Now, moving right along to the chemical composition analysis that was conducted by this geopolymer institute, and they determined that there were two different types of geopolymer systems that were utilized in the production of the blocks used in the construction of the Egyptian pyramids. You can see here, they determined that the core blocks are made of one chemical composition, and the casing stones are made from a different chemical composition, neither one of these being compatible with real natural limestone. So very, very interesting conclusions that were produced by using legitimate scientific laboratory applications. So we have two different geopolymer systems for the core blocks. The prototype is the Menk stone. It is made of Natrium, magnesium, calcium, aluminosilicates, plus halite, natrium chloride, common salt, dolomite, and calcite. This is the microtic binder. And for the casing blocks, casing blocks have up to 10% of silicate in the, the constitution, which is a lot for the geological glue and are uh, represented by the samples we got from Cheops and the Lower Stone. It is uh, magnesium silicate, sodium chloride, dolomite, and calcite. All right, now moving on to the chemistry. So on this slide, you can see this series of chemical reactions that are being proposed by the Geopolymer Institute that were involved in the production of this synthetic geopolymer stone. And I find this research to be highly compelling as it is directly applicable to my theory of this ancient civilization that was utilizing chemistry on an industrial scale for the benefit of the civilization. Now, at this point, I cannot say that I'm 100% on board with all of the conclusions that were reached by the Geopolymer Institute, but I find the chemistry and the application thereof to be highly, highly compelling. All right, on this slide, and much to the credit of the Geopolymer Institute, they do admit that they believe that there was a combination of synthetic geopolymer stone and natural quarry cut stone that was utilized in the construction of the Great Pyramid. And you can see here, this is a diagram of the King's Chamber inside of the Great Pyramid. And they do indicate that they believe that the granite utilized in this construction is natural quarry cut stone. And I 100% agree with that conclusion. Now, in regard to the overall scope of work, this ancient civilization that had a thorough understanding of chemistry would have understood when to work smarter and not harder. And it would certainly make a lot of sense that they would have utilized two different methodologies of construction when those properties were applicable. So they certainly could have used synthetic geopolymer stone, i.e. concrete, when it was needed, but they also would have utilized the properties of these natural stones in the construction of these monuments because it is a part of how these structures operated. So another analysis that was conducted by the Geopolymer Institute, which I find to be highly compelling, is their assessment of the hieroglyphs that are utilized to describe the construction of the Egyptian pyramids. So you can see here this hieroglyph called khusi, which is a verb that means to erect, to build, or to construct. And you can see here that there are two gentlemen using pounded sticks and molds to create artificial stones. And this is the methodology that they are proposing was utilized in the production of these concrete blocks. So you can see here this complete hieroglyphic sentence, which reads, with these products, they have built the pyramids. These products referring to the geopolymer stones, which are being produced by this guy right here with his little pounder and your mold. So in regard to this reassessment of the hieroglyphs utilized by the ancient Egyptians, I 100% agree with this practice. So we think that we understand the definition of these hieroglyphs. However, we have absolutely no idea the context or syntax in which these verbs were used. For example, the word fly, it can mean an insect. It can mean to fly through the sky, or it could also mean you're looking super dope. So again, there is context and syntax associated with these words that could give them multiple meanings. And again, we think that we have such a thorough understanding of this ancient language. However, I do agree that we have absolutely no idea whatsoever how these words were actually applied in the context of that civilization. We start making the cement by mixing sodium carbonate found in Egyptian natron and lime in 500 liters of water. We then add the kaolin inherent to Giza limestone and stir the mix with a wooden tool. 
We dump one ton of limestone rubble into the basin and mix it with the cement. Several days later, water has evaporated from the basin, so we remove the disaggregated limestone for making the block. Inspecting the mixture, 95% limestone aggregates and only 5% rock making binder. Between 12 and 17% of water give it the consistency of wet sand. One squeezes the mixture with his hand and it keeps its shape. This batch will quickly gain strength. We do all of the work manually, forming a human chain carrying buckets from the mixing area to the mold. We pour the limestone concrete mixture in a mold and pack it down with a tool called a rammer. Compacting the material requires little effort. The packing operation encourages cohesion and the denser mixture takes on high strength from the initial curing phase. When the climate is warm and beautiful, our crew rapidly produces a reagglomerated limestone that proved strong, dense and true to the plant's size and shape. The mold consists of small wooden boards, which can be reused many times for making other blocks. So the hieroglyphs that I showed in the previous slide were taken from a stela describing the construction of the Step Pyramid. So here is a picture of the northern face of the Step Pyramid, and you can see that the stones utilized in the construction of this pyramid are all very consistent in size. They're relatively small, they all have a relatively similar shape and size, so I could certainly see how someone could interpret these stones as being geopolymer. Because again, if you're creating a geopolymer, i.e. concrete, you have molds that are all the same size. And all of the stones that come out of those molds will all be exactly the same size and shape. They are very, very consistent. And that is exactly what you see here in the stones of the step pyramid. So I could certainly see how someone would interpret these stones as being artificial. However, when you get up to the Giza Plateau, take a look at the northern face of the Great Pyramid. And I challenge you to find any stones in this monument that are the exact same size and shape. All of these blocks are completely irregular. There is not one that is completely square. They are all oblong rectangles, and none of them are the same shape, and none of them are the same size. Just look at the different size and shape of all of these blocks here on the northern face of the pyramid. And this continues through all of the stones on the interior body of this structure. So also on this picture, I want to bring something to your attention. Can you spot on this picture which of these stones are actually made of modern concrete? And I'll give you a second to analyze this photo before I show you which ones of these are actually modern concrete. So you see here, this block is not original stone. This is a modern concrete block that has been inserted to prevent this stone here from falling down. And you can see it has an edge on it. This is a very clear indication that this is a piece of modern concrete. There's also another one in this picture, which is right over here. This is another piece of modern concrete that has been inserted underneath this block to prevent it from falling down. So there is absolutely modern concrete utilized in the renovation of these structures. Now in this geopolymer video, they don't say exactly where these samples were taken. So I cannot verify exactly where these stones were uh, extracted, nor can I say how the Geopolymer Institute got permission to take samples of stone from any of these structures. So I'm a little bit dubious of the verification process that went into their sample extraction and you can see, again, there is no consistency whatsoever in the size of these stones. So this is, to me, an indication that the stones utilized here in the body of the Great Pyramid are not artificial geopolymer. This is legitimate limestone that has been extracted and cut from a quarry and then used to build this monument. You can also see here in this slide, these are the flooring stones that surround the Great Pyramid. Again, the inconsistency in the size and shape of these are an indication that they are not produced in a form mold. These are not concrete. These are legitimate limestone. So moving on to the Bent Pyramid of Dashur. So in my exploration of the Bent Pyramid, I discovered this vein of halite salt. And this is a natural deposit of halite salt that moves through 
a series of blocks that were utilized in the core of the bent pyramid. Now, if this was artificial geopolymer, you would not have a natural deposit of salt that continues through multiple blocks in a series. There would be no salt deposits in an artificial geopolymer stone. So again, these are all indications that the stones used in the body of the Egyptian pyramids are not geopolymer, but they are legitimate quarry cut stones. That being said, the casing stones of the Egyptian pyramids were all very, very consistent. They all had a very specific slope. They all had a very specific shape. So it would certainly make a lot of sense to me, again, the civilization that understood when to work smarter and not harder, that it is possible that the casing stones that originally covered this core masonry could have been made from this geopolymer. All right, ladies and gentlemen, and we are looking here at a series of stones on the north side of the bent pyramid. And we'll start here. So you see this crack is actually a natural deposit of halite inside of the stone. And this is one stone. This is a separate stone here. This is another separate stone here. Going around, this is a completely different block. And moving here to this block, you can see that deposit continues, 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 continues. So now this is an indication that these stones were excavated from a quarry in this series and then placed here back exactly in the same place that they were found in the natural location from which they were excavated from the quarry. I won't say why I think they did that, but pretty interesting to note that they tried to replicate the geology of the quarry from which these stones were excavated. All right, ladies and gentlemen, now we are going to depart from Egypt and take a trip halfway across the world to a mysterious site in South America called Pumapunku. And I hope that all of you are very familiar with this unusual site. So when I started to research this site and the stone blocks that are found scattered across it, I immediately knew, and this was way before I discovered these videos from the Geopolymer Institute, that the stones that I was looking at at this site are not real stone. These, ladies and gentlemen, are perfect examples of synthetic geopolymer. These are artificial stones, and these H blocks, for example, were made in a mold. This is exactly what you would expect to find from a civilization that was utilizing synthetic geopolymer. The stones that were produced are going to all be the exact same size. They're going to be very, very consistent. Your mold shape is always the same and the stone being produced is always going to be the same. So these ladies and gentlemen are examples of synthetic geopolymer. So of course, ladies and gentlemen, a couple of years later, I stumbled across another video from the Geopolymer Institute and they were conducting the same scientific analysis of the stones found at Pumapunku and they determined that these stones are also synthetic geopolymer concrete. However, in South America, you have mostly sandstone and andesite as opposed to the limestone based geopolymer that they were discovering in Egypt. And you can see they conducted analysis of these H block andesite stones. Again, I immediately knew before I ever found this research that these blocks were not real stone, that these were artificial geopolymer. And they have also determined that there were two different methodologies, very similar to the construction of the Egyptian pyramids, that there were two different types of geopolymer utilized in the construction of the stones at Pumapunku. So you can see that a geopolymer in an alkaline medium was being utilized to produce the red sandstone and geopolymer in an acidic medium was being utilized to produce these gray andesite H blocks. All right, ladies and gentlemen, here you can see that the research being conducted by the Geopolymer Institute in France is legitimate science. Their research and the evidence that they are producing is being published in qualified peer-reviewed journals. This is not fringe science. 
This is legitimate laboratory chemistry and evaluation of these samples. Now, how did they get permission to take these samples? I have absolutely no idea, but the important point is that the research is being conducted and I find this to be highly compelling. They are doing the exact same thing that I am attempting to do here on the land of chem, which is to present a completely different paradigm regarding this ancient civilization that was utilizing chemistry for the benefit of their civilizations in all sorts of ubiquitous applications across the board. And that is exactly the same discussion that is being presented by the Geopolymer Institute. So I am, am I 100% on board with all of the conclusions? I can't really say at this point, because again, I know so much about the capabilities of these ancient stone masons, and there is clear evidence in Egypt that they were cutting and moving stone. We see the quarries, we see evidence like the unfinished obelisks. So they are clearly excavating real limestone from quarries. However, as I mentioned before, this civilization absolutely would have understood when to work smarter and not harder. And there would definitely have been applications for geopolymer as opposed to utilizing the properties of the natural stone. So again, ladies and gentlemen, I highly recommend that you watch both of the videos that I'm going to link in the video description. There's one describing the geopolymer used in Egypt and the second describing the geopolymer used in South America. And I will leave it up to you to reach your own conclusions. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the last stop on our journey across the world investigating claims of this mysterious geopolymer is the Kailasanatha Temple in India. So I stumbled across this video about five or six years ago when I was getting to know Alan from the Sacred Geometry Decoded channel, and he introduced me to this gentleman from the Half a Sheep YouTube channel. And this guy went and traveled to both Egypt and India to investigate the ancient structures of both of those countries. And while he was in India visiting the Kailasanatha Temple, he had a conversation with the caretaker of the site regarding the construction materials that were utilized to build this site. And I will let you hear it directly from him. So what you're saying here this is, is that the, the that, that these walls very old. These are the only the erosion to spiral. Yeah, but this is not the available stone, man made stone. Yeah, man made Old and is making combination sacred. Mm. Nowadays our knowledge is zero. Nobody knows the combination. Yeah. That is the reason not possible to maintain, not possible to repair. Yeah. So in that video, you hear the caretaker of the site describing the sacred ancient combination, the mysterious chemical formula that was utilized to produce the quote unquote man-made artificial stones, the synthetic geopolymer that was utilized to build the Kailasanatha temple. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. In today's episode, I have presented extraordinary evidence from across the globe of a civilization that was utilizing their advanced knowledge of chemistry for the production of artificial stones that were utilized in the construction of these ancient monuments. And I find this research to be extremely interesting. Now, in my personal opinion, I don't 100% agree with all of the conclusions regarding the stones used in Egypt, simply because there is so much evidence for the quarrying cutting and moving of real stones from the quarries across Egypt. There was plentiful stone all around Egypt. However, in these other locations where the stone was not readily available, it would certainly make a lot of sense that this ancient civilization would utilize its knowledge of chemistry in the vein of working smarter and not harder to create artificial stones for the construction of monuments of this nature. And I really do believe that this research needs to be taken into much more serious consideration by mainstream academia if we are ever intent on truly unlocking the mysteries of these ancient sites. Not to mention the fact that this research works directly in conjunction with my theory that the Egyptian pyramids were designed to produce chemicals on an industrial scale. So there is a synergy between these two ideas that I find to be extremely fascinating. And both of these ideas are presenting a revolutionary new paradigm for an ancient civilization that was predicated upon the knowledge and application of chemistry. So now you may be asking yourself, why is the discussion of geopolymer relevant to the function of the Egyptian pyramids? Well, I ask that you recall this experiment that we conducted utilizing samples of the geology that were utilized in the construction of the Egyptian pyramids. And the results of this experiment are incredibly counterintuitive. Limestone 
is made of calcium carbonate and shells. There is absolutely nothing in natural limestone that should be producing the discharge result that we saw in this experiment. So if you take into consideration the idea that this limestone is not natural limestone, but rather synthetic geopolymer that contains magnesium silicates and alumino silicates, it would certainly provide some extremely compelling evidence for a complete reinterpretation of the unbelievable results that were produced from this experiment. Again, we're demonstrating the properties of some of the geology utilized in the construction of the Egyptian pyramids in proximity to the electromagnetic field being produced by this machine. And this is just a quick video to demonstrate the properties of the limestone. And again, you can see and hear the discharge and the reason this is occurring is because limestone does not provide any electromagnetic impedance. The electromagnetic energy is flowing directly through the limestone and producing a discharge into the copper wire. And just a quick reminder that limited first edition print copies of The Land of Chem book are now available at www.thelandofchem.com. So if you'd like to help support the channel, just go to my website. You can pick up a copy of the book, grab yourself a t-shirt. Either way, all of the orders mean the world to me. So thank you all so much in advance. All right, everyone, that is it for tonight's video. This was episode 31 geopolymer and chemical sealants. I really hope you enjoyed today's video. As I promised in the previous episodes, as we proceed through the story of the land of chem, things will continue to get more and more interesting. So just stay tuned. A huge thank you to all of the new subscribers here on the land of chem. If you like the material, please leave it a like. If you haven't already subscribe to the land of chem and click that little notification bell so that you get noticed whenever these videos premiere. My website is thelandofchem.com if you want to pick up a copy of the book and help support the channel. My Instagram page is at the land of chem. I really appreciate everyone's support. I think that is it for today's episode. So I will see you next time.